Hello, welcome to the Arch and Pool Car. On our way back from Southampton at the salubrious setting of Birch Hanger Services after a lovely diversion away from the closed M11. It's Saturday afternoon, the 3 pm kickoffs are just getting started and we're not back in Norfolk yet. Um, we have just heard Leeds uh, getting thrashed 4 0 by Tottenham, so that was, that was nice from a Norwich perspective, but we are here to reflect on a 2-0 defeat at Southampton that frankly could have been a lot worse for Norwich City if Southampton had had their shooting boots with them. Welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. I'm Dave Freezer alongside Connor Southwell, Paddy Davitt and Adam Harvey on our way back to Norwich. Uh, Paddy, if I come to you first, um, let me just rattle through a few of the stats. 59% possession, 27 shots and 9 on target. Norwich had to make 42 clearances. They had to face 13 corners. They weren't playing Liverpool or Manchester City, but they were totally dominated in this game. Well, that's a good point you make, Dave, because prior to that swing of Man City to Liverpool, they were were on an upward curve, winning games, scoring goals. Um, looked like the players had kind of bought into a system that maximised what they were able to put on the pitch. Obviously, out of Dean Smith's hands, the injury to Adam Eder, that's that's knocked them off kilter a little bit. We might get into that in more detail, but uh, but the the sense we all hoped anyway was that okay, Man City and Liverpool games in their own right that you couldn't expect too much from Norwich, but you hoped they'd get the other side of that, and then this first game at Southampton would be the start of a you know almost picking up the threads again from that. Probably if you take a step back and look at the whole season, Norwich's most first fertile period in terms of points and performances and and just belief on and off the pitch but you know sadly if, if Southampton was the start of a, a new more positive chapter uh, as we get into the, the the defining part of the season it was uh, yeah it was a bit of a horror story really to, to butcher the, 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 the fictional analogy but um, for so many reasons not good enough on and off the pitch I mean Dean Smith in his post-match tells me too many 6 out of 10 performances I think I'm inclined to maybe put him as Shakespeare in that category as well because um, you mm. know, it, was, it was palpably clear at half time that that game was only going to go one way and the parallels with the Carrow Road game Dean Smith's first in charge worth reiterating uh, were pretty pretty clear to me or anybody watching that game I'm sure either in the stadium or, or remotely yet Norwich emerged with same personnel and more or less the same shape for the first 15 or so 20 minutes or so second half and um, OK Southampton didn't add to the score but I find it strange that they 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 deconstructed that first game in charge brilliantly, and we all know what happened from that point onwards. Josh Sargent came on for Todd Cantwell that day, and then Norwich were a different entity and uh, and really deserved their win. And what a win it was! Really got Dean Smith's reign up and running. But sadly, what we've seen on Friday night is probably too too much of what we saw under the previous head coach, and and it just re-emphasises really, you know. Six out of ten. That's probably Norwich this season. Really, not good enough. Not not enough quality. Not not enough guile. Uh, not good enough in both boxes, and also not good enough in central midfield. I thought that's where the game was won and lost against Southampton. They were palpably superior. You know, Romeo scores, but he was he was the enforcer across the middle of the park. Ward Prowse. We all know what a quality player he is, and and Elianusi and, and Stuart Armstrong almost overloading in those areas by tucking in field, and and the three of Norman, Gilmore, McLean, nowhere near it. Not at the races uh, as as, Nor- as Norwich were not. So, um, really, it's looking pretty bleak now. I mean, as you say, Dave, we've just listened to Leeds and they sound like a, a rabble as well. Uh, <laughs> so, can't wait for that Ellen Road game in, in a couple of weeks' time. But, you know, when we're still to hear what happens to the likes of Watford and, and Newcastle and, and Burnley for the remainder of the weekend. But it could look a lot a lot darker uh, than it is already and it's pretty pretty bleak now so uh, yeah just when you hoped that Southampton would be the start of another really positive cycle under Smith and Shakespeare we're sort of back examining the sort of frailties and fragilities that ultimately led them to dispense with Daniel's services and bring in Dean Smith um, and ultimately you can't escape the fact that it, it it's what we what we saw at Southampton is probably what we've felt for most of the season they just don't have enough quality in the 
in the squad or in the team for that matter certainly when you come up against and it is worth reiterating you know it wasn't Liverpool it wasn't Man City but it is one of the form sides in the division you know one defeat in the 12 that is now Southampton uh, one defeat all season at home so they are a very very well drilled outfit under Hassan Hootel now but that aside you know Norwich made it far too easy and it comes of course in the wake of what Norwich produced for at least an hour and a little bit more at Anfield against one of if well, along with Man City, certainly the best side in, in England. And you come off that game and, and OK, the result went against Norwich ultimately, but, but so much belief and composure in their performance. And then you see what they served up at Southampton and you have to question what on earth has gone on in the intervening period, that they were so far off the levels they'd shown at Anfield. And fundamentally, if they can, not very, very urgently. They've got Brentford, obviously, next. We'll, we'll, go, we'll skip over the Liverpool League Cup, the FA Cup tie for now, but the, the next two league games are Brentford and Leeds. Dean Smith didn't want to probably, understandably, portray them as must-wins, but given that the two sides were listing down there with them, that we're obviously recording prior to Brentford playing Newcastle, um, I, I can't see any, any route to safety that doesn't involve taking six from these next two league games. So, that's the corner they backed themselves into, and Really, they only have themselves to blame on the evidence of what they, they served up on the South Coast, which was pitifully uh, meagre. Yeah, we're going to hear that phrase quite a bit at the moment, that it doesn't matter what the other teams do, because Norwich aren't picking up points. If they're not winning games, there's no chance of them getting out of survival. So we can record ahead of Brentford-Newcastle and, and ahead of Watford uh, playing because and Burnley, because it, it doesn't matter. No, if Norwich don't turn their form around then they're done for. Um, Adam, you put that clip out on, on our social channels, didn't you, um, of Smith saying uh, there were too many 6 out of 10s, and uh, <laughs> a lot of the responses were saying that he was being rather generous, weren't they? I'd have to agree, yeah. I think, obviously, other than you could maybe make a claim for Angus Gunn and, and Grant Hanley, which I think you said about in your verdict, yeah. I thought both of those stepped up yesterday and, and done a pretty good job at keeping the scoreline down to, to only two, but then again, you could say a lot, you know, the wasted chances that Southampton had, they probably should have buried on, on another day, and it could have easily been four or five, and and that's probably the most alarming thing. I think you know you go into Southampton, who who aren't the you know the elite of English football, let alone European football, like the Liverpools and Man Cities that Norwich have played in recent weeks, and it's looked so far off the pace. And I mean that midfield, you know, I think Billy Gilmore once again, you know, just highlighting a player that was brought here with so much hype, and and mm. you know, I think a lot of, well, a lot of my friends are Chelsea fans, and they couldn't believe that we'd you know managed to attract a player that they thought should uh, be starting probably for the Chelsea side based on some of his performances in the Euros uh, obviously but mainly that England game where I think he also well, he bossed the game and, and on you know the big stage at Wembley so to come into this team and he just he just doesn't look up for the relegation battle and I mean the midfield to me is is very championship like in terms of the players we've got in there and we just got ran you know the show yesterday was ran by Romeo and and Ward Price of Southampton and you look at that caliber of player versus what we've got and I think that's ultimately why Norwich probably can't really compete on the Premier League stage irrespective of um, the performance that they're putting in. Yeah, Stuart Armstrong was good as well, wasn't he, on, on the right? He's pretty influential for them and Norwich basically just need three Mateus Normans, don't they? But I think a lot of people feel that Lise Malou, um was pretty harshly dropped for Gilmore anyway and you could maybe see a few signs of why Smith had gone down that route in the first half because he pinged a couple of nice balls in that actually got Norwich going forward and Norwich needs to score goals. So it's quite obvious that they scored 15 in 26 games. I mean... <laughs> if that doesn't tell you that a team's in relegation trouble, then, then, then what will, really? Um, Connor, there was an interesting comment towards the end of the NCFC live blog on, on Pink and Plus. Um, I can't remember exactly who said it off the top of my head, but um, it was talking about the pod specifically and saying, <laughs> when you guys review this game, don't even bother talking about survival. It's not going to happen. They're down. They're done. So just crack on. We're talking about the championship next season. Is that quite where your head's at yet? <laughs> No, not yet. I, th- I think um, it, it does feel like uh, survival is, is slipping away and, and I would say it's probably felt like that beyond maybe about five, six games this season, in truth. Um, but I think I think Pad summarised it perfectly, really. I think it, it has to be six points from the next two games or ultimately we are going to be in a position where we're talking about Norwich City again going down to the Championship, again having to rebuild their squad and again... Having to um, having to take on the the challenge of the of, of the championship, which we all know isn't easy, and uh, and clubs can get stuck there. It's, it's a very difficult task to get promoted from. But 
I'm, I'm not quite at the place where I'm ready to, to stick an R next to their name and, and write off the remaining 12 games of the season. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you looked at... Uh, well, I, I looked at some of the Norwich players out there. It just felt very resigned, I think, last night. Um, I mean, you, you've mentioned various times your, your chat with Grant, Grant Hanley felt a little bit like that. It, mm. it, it feels like, um, you know, all, all the fight that everyone saw at Anfield and they got so much, rightly got so much praise for just wasn't evident against Southampton. It, it was almost like, you know, they, they, were, they were sat in our chairs going, oh, Southampton are a good side. Yes, they're in form. And they didn't really have a, a, a solution to the to the problems that they posed in terms of their pressing, the, the midfield. I mean, Norwich had three players against a, a midfield two. Um, and I thought I think they could have had six midfield options in there, and Southampton still would have dominated. I mean, they ended the game with four in the, in that kind of midfield diamond, and and still Romeo and uh, and Ward Prowse asserted their dominance. So, yeah, I think ultimately you you boil it down and you come back to again as uh, as Pad said, a point around quality, and and there's not enough of it, and there's too many players in that side that you feel if you're having to rely on those in the situation that Norwich City are in. Ultimately, they're not good enough to keep you at, at this level. And you know what we saw last night was Southampton so comfortably better than Norwich. I mean, that's that's just the gap to the middle of the Premier League, let alone <laughs> yeah. let alone the top of the Premier League. It's such a massive gulf. Um, and at the moment, it's a it's a chasm which I'm not quite sure to kind of zoom out and be a bit more philosophical about it. How a club like Norwich City approaching it in the way that they do go about sort of climbing over that it's it's very difficult I think to to work out how Norwich City in their current form end up becoming a, a stable championship club uh, Premier League club rather in the way that Southampton have done um, which hasn't been based on on money and whatnot so yeah the golf was was pretty stark um, the body language wasn't good the performance was flat um, and uh, yeah the next two games are absolutely massive if they want to stay in the Premier League well, I don't think there's much point as going through the the game specifically. Everybody's seen the goals by now. You know, it's actually a fairly scrappy goal from a bit of a Brandon Williams sort of slip slash mistake that Che Adams manages to get past Max Aarons and Angus Gunn eventually, and then a brilliant shot from um, Oriol Romeo to finally seal the deal in the 88th minute. Which <laughs> I think if anybody had actually got in the way of it, would have hurt quite a lot to be honest, because he absolutely battered the ball towards that top left corner. But it's safe to say they had loads more chances. They Angus Gunn did make quite a few saves, but they they should have been uh, quite a few of those should have just been buried, and he shouldn't have had a chance. But they fired quite a few of them straight at him. So let's sort of park the actual events of the game and, and more dig deeper into what you started down the road of Pad with the the tactical changes and the substitutions. I mean, I felt at half time that he had to change it. He had to match them up as a four four two. Get Sergeant up top with Pookie, who Pookie was looking quite sharp, but he was so isolated that he just wasn't getting anything much to play with, was he? He did actually create, well, Gilmore passed it down the right, then Pookie does well, and he creates those two early chances, doesn't he, for Sergeant, who was a pretty tame effort, and then Gilmore follows up with a shot as well, and that was blocked also. So it's not until the 72nd minute that he responds, he brings off Rashitza and Norman and brings on Lise Malou and Rupp. And it did kind of work, didn't it? Which maybe makes it even more frustrating that if he'd have switched to something like the 4-4-2 diamond straight away, um, he did go to a sort of a 4-2-3-1 after half-time, didn't he? But if he'd have made bigger changes, then maybe they could have tied, turned the tide. Yeah, but I understand, well, certainly how he started that game, because it, if you draw a, a parallel with how they finished against Southampton in his first game at Car Road... Yeah, we talked about Sergeant coming on for Cantwell, but but also it was noticeable that day that the same three midfield players, Norman, Gilmore, McLean, they got a lot higher, uh, locked on to Romeo and Ward Prowse as it was at Car Road that day as well. And and Norwich as a collective just played a lot higher up the pitch and you were seeing Rashid that took that point about, which Dean Smith also raised as well, the isolation of Pukki. The Car Road reverse fixture in the second half, you had Rashid to because the three midfielders had pushed higher in and almost condensed the play a bit higher towards the Southampton goal. You had then when they turned the ball over, Rashid is turning and he's right there with with Puki and and I can understand why you know he he, he persisted with essentially the same finishing eleven that day uh, for this game, but palpably it wasn't working by half time. You know you could see the the gulf really in terms of one side 
very cohesive. They all understood their roles. They're full of confidence. You know, we can't underestimate what a priceless commodity that is. You know, they've, they've drawn recently with Manchester City, and, and we all we all saw first hand at Carrow what an unbelievable team they are. Um, they've won at Tottenham. Um, you know, never an easy achievement, despite they're a bit inconsistent Spurs, but. Uh, you know they're on a really good run, and the players are confident. They want the ball. They want to express themselves. They feel that they're on an upward curve, and that's very hard to counteract if you're in Norwich's situation. But I just think it was quite evident by half time and getting into the early part of the second half what Norwich were trying to do wasn't working. Um, they were, the, the, you know, trying to build through gun at the back and the centre backs, and then move it through wasn't working. Southampton's high press, um, and Smith talked about that as well. You know the quality. To, needed to be better you have to string four or five passes together to get the other side of the press and then show the quality of the other side now how many moves can we we recall where Norwich were able to string four or five passes together very very few if any um, so if that's not working then change it and and go back for me it was almost crying out for the the Watford approach or the Everton approach which obviously you know risk of repeating myself was probably Norwich's only consistent period of results and goal scoring and threats and performance levels which when they went with as it was Adam Ida up alongside Pukki they had Sargent one side they had Rashid to the other okay no Ida fine but you can play Sargent more central and then do you then look to maybe get Jonathan Rowe onto the pitch you know and make something happen Poeta was another option as well um, he obviously reached that conclusion in Shakespeare because they ended up pretty much although it wasn't uh, maybe a, a four in, in the attacking four sense it was more the diamond and then Sargent and Pukki ahead but but clearly they they could see the same trend that we can all see and as I say it's a mystery for me I mean you know even 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 bringing Rashid are off you know I said to Dean after the game you know was that an injury I mean I can understand Norman because he's obviously had this period of time on the sidelines and you know it's probably is an ask for him to, to go 90 minute 90 minute at this stage so, so that that made sense on that level but I, I, I can understand why given how potent Rashica has been recently in terms of Norwich's attacking threat no more so than at Anfield a few days earlier that, that he sort of sacrifices him and you know you think well was there an injury there but Dean Smith knocked that one on the head his, his response was that he felt he was looking a bit tired and a bit jaded and and because of the switch they wanted to go with a diamond he didn't think sort of Rashica in that 10 role behind the front two was, was necessarily going to get the best out of him but OK, I understand that logic, but, but I mean, you said it at the start, 15 goals in the league this season um, is a paltry figure. And, and within that, Milo Rashica has shown, most recently at Anfield, he does have a goal threat about him. So why would you take him off the pitch? I couldn't fathom that at all, really. You know, go ch- change the system, but still, are, 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 we, are we arriving at a conclusion there's better attacking options in this current squad than Milo Rashica? Because if they are, I don't see them. So, yeah, as I said... I, I, the players, yep, no, no, no doubt about it. They were they were lacking, but I just felt Smith and Shakespeare were lacking in a few areas as well. And that's probably the first time over the entire piece since they've come in. Yeah, there's been certain games or certain portions of games. The Newcastle one will always stick out. I think that they couldn't they couldn't decode that against ten men for eighty minutes to to the point where they actually got a win rather than scrambling for a late draw that night. But but that was the first one I think for me where. I don't think they got it right, those two, or Bramley, and um, the players certainly didn't get it right. So, yeah, a bad bad night for all concerned, really. And um, unfortunately, where Norwich are in terms of the, their league position, they can't really afford too many more of those, if any, uh, between now and the end of the season, because, you know, the road is fast running out, and, um, and it's already a very, very, you know, very difficult task, really, to plot a route to survival from here. But... Certainly, they have to. And when I say they, I mean the coaching staff and the players have to get more right than wrong in every game they play. And I think we would all agree on Friday night that wasn't the case. Irrespective of how good Southampton were, Norwich made it too easy for them. Yeah, that Newcastle game. Well, I think I'll always go back to that Lise Malou chance right at the end when he should have scored. And what an important goal that would have been, wouldn't it? And who knows what how things would have worked out but I mean the other side was Dowell wasn't it what 80th minute I think he uh, he came on for Gilmore just after Gilmore had been crunched by Romeo and they'd gone on a, an attack and Norwich had basically just about survived and as soon as Dowell came on he got crunched by Romeo as well <laughs> and, and and you know as you said the guy dictated the play and it was a really good sort of defensive midfield performance and 
Dow wasn't really able to to offer too much to it. So I think that'll just about do. That's a that's a good chunter. So, uh, you know, deep breath. We've uh, got some stuff off our chest there. It was a pretty dark uh, mood amongst the support on Friday evening. So let's start turning our attentions to the games ahead. Liverpool Wednesday night in the FA Cup and then a huge match against Brentford on Saturday. We live Norwich City. The build-up. The passion. The drama. The last-minute winners. The debate. That's why we've created Pink and Plus. Plus. The app that takes you beyond the headlines. With exclusive columns, blogs, podcasts and videos, we've got you covered. Subscribe today. Pink and Plus. Stay ahead of the game. Download now on the App Store and on Google Play. Get your thinking caps on in terms of who you'd like to or who you'd expect to see playing on Wednesday night, really, because um, it feels to me like Dean Smith needs this game like a hole in the head, really. <laughs> uh, now, it, initially, it seemed like, um, you know, go to Liverpool in the fifth round of the FA Cup. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit glamorous. If you can get through to that, then great. You're not far, not far from Wembley then. Another quarter final and... It sort of had a little bit of excitement, but with the way things have evolved, these three successive defeats, I really can't see him being particularly excited to go there now. But particularly from a fan's point of view, if anyone's making that trip or, the, or a long trip and you don't live somewhere in the proximity of Liverpool um, on Wednesday night, despite the fact that it's on TV, then, then fair play to you because that is some commitment. Um, I guess it's a good opportunity for some people to get to Anfield who maybe haven't before. But anyway, Connor, if I come to you first. Um, the defence and, and the keeper, uh, because that's that's an interesting talking point on the back of Friday night, wasn't it? Dean Smith had teed up the fact that he had a decision to make. Tim Crawl, Tim Crawl was back, but he decided to stick with Angus Gunn. Um, what do you think happens on Wednesday night? Yeah, I, assume, I guess we all assume Crawl gets that opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, after the game, he said he, he made a distinct point of saying Crawl wasn't Premier League ready. Um, so I, I think that would probably suggest that he, he, he'll he likely be FA Cup ready um, it, it, for, the, for the game on Wednesday with uh, then a view to Brentford but I, I must I must admit given what we, we said about Angus I think that would now be incredibly uh, incredibly harsh for for him to lose this but I, I mean for all of the players from, from that performance last night to kind of be talking about Angus Garner as maybe the one who could lose his start uh, his starting place feels a, a little bit unfair so mm. yeah I, I think I think it will be Tim Krul ultimately um, in terms of back four, I suppose you're, you're looking at players like your new list coming in, Kabak coming in. It'll be interesting because obviously we, um, we, we've learned subsequently, I think, via Chris Gorham that Grant Hanley's actually suspended for this one, haven't we? So um, I suppose there's maybe a little decision there to be made over whether you, you go with Ben Gibson or you give Christoph Zimmerman some minutes. Um, personally, I think you'll probably edge for, for Zimmerman given the experience that he has. It's, it's not like you're kind of throwing in a... Uh, and Andrew Mbamadeli into that situation, for example. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it would be a uh, back four of your new list: Kabak, Zimmerman, um, right back. So I suppose Sam Byram would would come in as well. Yeah. So I, I think I think it will be fully changed, to be honest. Then I think that will be the the case across the team because, as you said, I think if you offered Dean Smith now uh, a whole week of training or uh, the opportunity to go and play Liverpool at Anfield in the fifth round of the FA Cup, I think he'd choose a full full week of training given where Norwich City are and. The deficiencies that we all saw on on Friday night at Southampton, um, and of course they're, they're playing a, a team again who press really well, uh, and uh, and that's something they really struggle with against Southampton. And ultimately, there's there's two ways you kind of play a press: you either play through it or you play over it. And if you're playing Team Bukki up front, which I, I know you'll move that, uh, on to to the other guys, but if they're playing Team Bukki up front, very difficult to play over a press because that's he's not a, a hold up player by nature. Um, so if you're playing Puki, you almost have to play through it, which is kind of what we saw them them try to do at Southampton. So it's going to be interesting, I think, to see how he approaches this. But to be honest, I think for where Norwich City are, and there is part of me that would like to see a quarter final at Carroll Road, given everything that happened, um, obviously with the pandemic, really robbing everyone of that Carroll Road quarter final against Manchester United, which would have been quite the occasion um, with a full house. It was actually behind closed doors in the end, and Norwich weren't too bad, but. I think there's there's going to be a part of everyone, especially given the way the season is going, that would would like to see Norwich progress. But 
ultimately the position they're in right now it's it's all about Brentford and it's it, I think it's just about getting through this game relatively unscathed Liverpool are going to make changes they're in the League Cup final tomorrow as well so they've got their distractions elsewhere um, but I think it's about getting this, through this one unscathed and uh, and looking ahead to Brentford yeah, that quarter-final when a certain Mr Campwell scored a rather good goal when Norwich weren't far off taking that game to penalties despite Tim Close's red card and that was quite an entertaining one despite the fact it was behind closed doors. So yeah, very interesting. I, just the way he approaches it in, in terms of whether he feels that the players need to keep in their rhythm for the Brentford game. I mean, obviously that's taken away from you from Hanley, but... I guess we, we've seen the League Cup game against Liverpool as well when that was kind of against their... Well, it was against their second string. They played some youngsters and stuff that night. They, I don't think Klopp will make as many changes as that, but they've got such a, a busy schedule that he, I, I think he will have to keep the likes of Salah and stuff on, on the bench and, and just hope that he doesn't have to bring them on. And if Norwich play like they did on... on last night then then he won't have to probably um, but let's move through to the rest of the team and Adam if um, if we look at the midfield and and just the, I suppose the shape well, if we think that he does make a lot of changes um, how, how can you see it going? Um, obviously last time out in Liverpool was a, a 4 3 3 I'd be inclined to say that obviously that worked for large spells of that game so mm. I think if Liverpool well they stereotypically play a 4 3 3 as well so if he wants to go and match them up then I could see him playing that and the sort of free in the midfield option, uh, you know, the same as same as last time. So, but as for what he's going to do, I mean, I found it interesting that he brought um, obviously Rupp and Les Malou on last night. Obviously, he needed to change the system, but the fact that those were the two midfielders that came on, maybe that's a an indication that those two will be in, you know, in the running for a start on on Wednesday evening. Um, and then I sort of think, obviously, Sorensen's back in training, but whether he's available for you know a start in terms of such a big occasion for. In terms of an FA Cup fifth round uh, tie, I, I'm not so certain. But uh, but then obviously with Norman, you don't do you really want to risk him in, in a cup tie mm. in a game that you know I think he's obviously one of the sort of standout players that I think is Premier League caliber in this Norwich City squad, and I don't really want to see him start at Anfield and then pick up an injury that I think would pretty much you know put an R next to Norwich's name, even if there isn't one already. I think you know he's such a such a crucial cog in that midfield, and I think they missed him in in the period that he was out. So yeah, I'd be inclined to say that he'll go Lays Malou Rup and then. As for the last one, I mean, Gilmore's started both games uh, against Liverpool and in the Cup as well, I think, this season. So Got Sorensen back as well, haven't they? He's back in training, at least. Yeah, so I think if you want more of a defensive option, then obviously Sorensen's probably a man, but I could I could see him still tilting towards Gilmore. He seems to enjoy playing him in the team, and he seems to be sort of a player that he likes to use. So, yeah, I think I'd probably go Lazeman, Lou Rook, Gilmore. Rook's just slightly slightly deeper in, in the three. To finish it off then, Pad, uh, I think we're probably likely to see Josh... Sergeant as a striker, aren't we, in one way or the other? Because this is a good chance to say, look, you've sort of fallen down the pecking order as a striker. Go and show me what you can do, because that's what he wants to be, I think, as well, isn't it? Do you reckon maybe we could see John Rowe up front with him? Because he he's that sort of player, isn't he? He's not really a winger. He's not an out and out striker. He's, he's he's sort of yet to settle into a defined role, isn't he? Yeah, it's a good shout that, and of course, you know, pertinent because. It was a player who had to be talked about pre-match from Dean Smith. Is Zolish? You know, mm. what do you do with him? Do you, if the guy's struggling by, his, by Dean Smith's own admission in terms of his confidence and that price tag, that's sort of a bit of a millstone around his neck. That, do you try and inject some confidence into him by saying, "Look, I, I believe in you. You know, you you are a player who can have a future at this club, and here's here's a stage to go and show us what you're all about. And and don't worry almost too much if it doesn't quite work out because, you know." We believe in you. Essentially, um, that would be a big call. I think, uh, yeah, I'm inclined to think on the evidence we've seen so far. This, well, since John Rowe came into the mix, that he's likely to plump for a row over Zolis. Um, but you'd, you'd expect Zolis to be on the bench minimum. Um, I think Poheta would come into the equation if, if we, we've sort of decided amongst us that it's going to be a three up top and Sergeant should central uh, plank in that forward facing three. Um, I don't see if you know if Rashida was. Uh, Showed a bit of wear and tear on Friday night. Then why risk him? Why risk him for what is, let's be honest, the far bigger game against Brentford Saturday week? Um, Huge, massive game. So yeah, I don't. I, we won't be seeing Rashid. So I wouldn't have thought. And um, if we're not seeing Rashid, so then 
there is a there's a window of opportunity. I mean, of course, you know, Dower would come into the equation as well. I'm sure um, you knew this if you're not playing him as a left back. You know, there's, we've, there's been a lot of chat about could he play further forward. I don't necessarily think that's in Dean Smith's mind, but um, but but I mean, essentially, I put him in pointers after the game on Friday night. What I think, you know, they may ultimately, as we all expect, probably exit the FA Cup at this stage, but. With the bigger Premier League picture in mind, if one of two of the lads we've just discussed here over the last five minutes, if they could just put their hands up and, and show something against a top quality team, even if they make a few changes themselves on a grand stage, that says yeah they might be able to add something to the mix in the Premier League. I think that's that's the dividend Dean Smith will be looking for. You know, of course you'd look you love to progress to the next round, but ultimately. Um, let's just pick, you know, pick a name at random. John Rowe gets a start and really catches the eye, uh, and, and really looks fearless in that type of company. Then, for me, he has to come into the to the the, the thinking a bit more than than maybe just the old cameo. Because what increasingly, what have they got to lose now? They get into that stage now. If it, if it isn't working with in terms of adding goals and creativity with the current personnel, then fundamentally. They don't really have anything to lose. They're heading back to the championship as it stands. So, you know, he needs a spark from somewhere. Could could a young man who's no battle scars, not fearful of anything, you can see when he takes the pitch that he's actually loving the challenge, loving the the, the acceleration in his career, the, uh, from development football at Colney in front of a smattering of fans to, you know, like last night, you know, he didn't get on, but he's there in a, a 30,000 stadium watching, you know, not just watching, but feeling like he's part of a Premier League setup, I'd, I'd be inclined to look at that because that will, at the very least, offer you some energy, some um, tempo, uh, and and some you know fearlessness into the game, and uh, and, and they're going to need all of that if they're going to do anything in terms of purely in terms of the FA Cup element, but certainly for the broader picture of trying to salvage this Premier League season. Indeed. Right. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts, boys. Thank you all very much for listening. Um, not the cheeriest of pods again, but we can only work with what we got, I'm afraid. And um, we try to dig down into it as much as we can. Um, I think it's also worth saying with everything that's going on in the world um, in the past few days that football does feel that little bit more incongruous to things at the moment, doesn't it? And, um, oh, uh, Pad just shows me a, a good result. Palace in the lead against Burnley. Um, so we'll see how those work out. So let's hope that stays the same. But yes, as I was saying, uh, with everything else that's going on in the world at the moment, it um, yeah feels uh, a little bit incongruous to be talking about football. But uh, it, uh, that does remind us that it isn't the end of the world. If Norwich go back to the Championship, they are still in a, an enviable position for, for most clubs. But I think we're all just desperately hoping that we're not feeling that sense of deja vu from from two years ago it won't be behind closed doors this time so it probably will be angrier because it would have been angrier anyway for it to happen a second time around but I think we're all just getting that sinking feeling a little bit aren't we that we're going to have to go through uh, that again the way things are looking up so let's just hope that Wednesday night as as we've just teed it up there some of these players if they get the opportunity take them and 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 offer some kind of change to the narrative and that they could offer something a bit different against Brentford because as down as everybody's felt this weekend um, if Norwich go and find a way to beat Brentford they are very much still alive it would still be possible that could just provide the spark and then as we've seen Leeds are in a real mess Bielsa may even not be the manager there for too much longer if you go to Ellen Road and get a win as well then the mood would, would very much have shifted and well totally transform from where we sit right now but that's the situation um so keep it locked on pink and plus i'm actually missing wednesday night's game um i've lucky <laughs> you um just uh, fortunately uh, a week has coincided with that one so um you missed the anfield game the other day didn't you kind of for your um for your birthday so um i will be following all your coverage i hope you guys do as well if you're not already subscribed to pink and plus then you've heard us talking about it plenty you'll have seen my interview with Matthias norman the other day which followed on from the exclusive chat with uh, brandon williams as well so we'll keep all that sort of stuff flowing um as, as much as we can just 199 a month and your first 30 days for free but for now we will head home i was hoping to make it back in time to watch the rugby but it doesn't look like i'll be making kickoff because we've still got an hour and a half or so on the road to go uh, but we will head back to norfolk wherever you are listening in the world stay safe look after yourself and it's on to anfield on wednesday night thanks for listening